Welcome to episode 69 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes and, well, apologies to begin with for the slight delay between episode 68 and 69. Um, Easter intervened and I was busy doing other bits and pieces, including cracking on with the writing of book number four. And I'm sure I'll mention that again in the future, but I'm aiming to get that published by the end of of 2023 or the beginning of 2024 so look out for that in the future in the meantime the podcast now i was contacted late last year by somebody called susan crump she'd actually been using the podcast to help her prepare for her own trip across europe with her husband ron and in this episode of the podcast we're going to hear all about that particular journey that she made with her husband ron so here she is talking about amsterdam to athens Enjoy. So hi, I'm Susan. I am half of Team Crump, and I was lucky enough to have had the opportunity to ride my bicycle from Amsterdam to Athens in 52 days. I also recently chose to leave my full-time job and go part-time so that I could spend more time with my family and continue my travels. In addition, I'm a lifelong fitness enthusiast and Francophile. I teach spin class and I love all things French. I'm Ron Crump and uh, the other half, clearly not the better half, but uh, you know, I am a also a long life enthusiast of anything outdoors. Uh, I was a competitive runner for 30 plus years, uh, just naturally transitioned to the bicycle as I got older, um, especially as my friends were also riding and groups were popping up here. So as we moved through life and at this point in the, my early 60s, it was uh, time to find new adventures other than just running and competing. Uh, some friends introduced us to the thought of touring, and immediately we jumped on that, and uh, here we are. We've finished a you know twenty one hundred mile ride for our first tour. Uh, simply amazing. Um, I'm happy to call ourselves travelers and not simply tourists. Okay, right. Well, we're going to talk about your trip from uh, the Netherlands down to Greece in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, first of all, where are you based in America? We are based out of Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Um, everyone knows Louisville, Kentucky for the big Kentucky Derby horse races. So if you kind of picture where that's at, uh, we're about a half hour south of that location. But where are you from originally? You're not from Kentucky. No. Um, as a matter of fact, I was born in France um, in La Rochelle. My mother is French. My father was an American soldier and uh as he left the service, we ended up in Muncie, Indiana, not too far north of where I live now. And Susan, where are you from originally? So I'm originally from Michigan, and I actually met Ron in Germany when I was very, very young, when, yes. when we both served in the military. Okay, so that has a connection with your trip that we're going to talk about. Uh, you were in the military, and you were stationed during the 80s and 90s in, in military bases in Germany. Is that right? Yes. We were stationed outside of Frankfurt in uh, Hanau, Germany. Uh, my first tour was there, and that's where Susan and I met. And uh, subsequently, we returned to Germany for another tour um, outside of Nuremberg in the early 90s. Tremendous tours. We, we loved everything German and, and European. And both our children were born there. Yes. Are you allowed to tell me what you did in the army? Oh, yes. Um, for 20 years, I was a combat medic. I served in the medical field the entire time. And the same with me. I was a, I was a medic. I did not serve for 20 years. I just served for two. Yeah, because we started a family and both didn't need to be gone. So you've had a lifelong interest in fitness. And Susan, you're also... A, an experienced triathlete, yeah? I am a triathlete. <laughs> I've done two Ironman 70.3s, so I don't know how experienced I am. I loved, I loved the triathlon, so yes. 
She's very modest. She was successful at both attempts and did tremendously well on very little training. And I really enjoy the triathlon. I enjoy everything, outdoors, biking, riding, and swimming. But the one thing that you'd never done was a long-distance cycle. You were cyclists, I understand, but you'd never done a long-distance cycle. True. We were, you know, day cyclists, group group rides and locally, you know, 20, 20 to 50 miles. Uh, Susan's gone further. My longest ride ever was one 50-mile ride. Uh, other than that, you know, 25 to 35 miles, you know, once or twice a week was what I did on the bicycle with a, with the, the local riding group. And I had ridden often in preparation for the triathlons, but I think my longest ride prior to our trip was probably 60 or 65 miles. So I conquered the metric century, but really before that, beyond our family and day rides, we'd never experienced a multi-day tour. Okay, so what made you decide one day to head off from Rotterdam all the way down to Athens? What made you think, right, we're going to try this? We happened to have some friends that it, the other couple you see in the photos, uh, Pam and Ralph, were ex- very experienced and knowledgeable cyclists. They had done multiple long tours on, through Europe and also um, here in the States. I believe Ralph had actually done a coast to coast and they did some three, four week cycling tours in Canada and the Northwest of America. So one day they said, well, we're going to retire now. So, and our plan is to ride from the Netherlands to Athens. Would you guys be interested in doing that with us? We think of all the people we know, you two could do it with us and have the physical ability. And it took about three seconds to say, I'm in, we're, we're doing this. This is something that's good. This is for us. We have got to go and, and, and seize this adventure right now. So your friends, they were called Ralph and Pam, Pam. And apart from having just retired, what was their motivation for cycling from Rotterdam to Athens? Like us, actually more than us, they spent 15 years in Europe. They were in Germany for 15 years as teachers. So going back to the place that they were at for so many years for the first time, plus going to Eastern Europe, which they had not been to. None of um, us had been. You know, none of us had been to Eastern Europe. So we were going to revisit places we hadn't been back to since we left the service and, the, and, and reminisce and go through all the nostalgic feelings, plus go somewhere we hadn't been and experience something completely new and unknown. When did you make the decision to travel to Europe? Pre-COVID or was it during COVID or after? It was during COVID. During COVID. Yeah. It was the late summer of 2000. And no, just 2020. Late 2020. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> late 2020, when Ralph posed the question and we jumped on it. And that gave us two years to get our mind around it. It gave us, you know, solid 18 months to gather all of our equipment which actually was a bit difficult during lockdown and COVID with supply issues. We had a hard time finding bikes. We have road bikes, but we needed steel touring bikes. And on that note, um, to get a steel touring bike at the time, which was near impossible in the States, I actually ordered it from uh, the UK and they shipped it here. Yeah, right. Were you not tempted just to wait until you arrived in the Netherlands and buy a bike when you arrived? I considered doing that, but I wasn't very comfortable with the idea because I had no idea what bicycles to to get. I, I was very clueless on, on touring bikes. So uh, getting my hands physically on one and understanding the components, which really aren't that much different, and... Uh, getting the rack situated and actually getting my bags on there and feeling it and 
it was necessary for me. I'm more of a hands-on person. So what bikes did you buy? Bought the Fuji Touring Bikes. Yeah, Fuji Touring Bikes, they um, were pretty much entry level. They were. Mine was a 2020, and I think Ron's was a 2021. Yes. So my components were a little bit older, but they were wonderful. Ron did have disc brakes. I still had, what are those brakes called? Cantilever. Cantilever brakes, and Ron had disc brakes. But the white, the bikes turned out to be to be wonderful for entry level for our first tour. We had no mechanical issues. Oh, Ron had one mechanical issue. <laughs> but other than that, beyond upgrading our tires about three weeks in, we did upgrade due to flats about three weeks in. We had no mechanical issues. They were wonderful bikes, and we're going to continue with them this year. Yes. Okay, well, we'll perhaps mention or we'll discuss where you're going to go this year in a few minutes. But uh, so you've got the equipment. Before you flew over to Europe, did you do any practice rides back in Kentucky? One. <laughs> we did one one day ride and put, <laughs> of all the things, <laughs> we loaded our panniers with an old encyclopedias for the weight and rode about, I don't know, 25 miles, okay. 35, mm-hmm. 25, 30 miles on some on a trail that's got switchbacks and hills and just to get the feel, especially we had never rode with anything on our front wheel. So the balancing act and turning was a little, little different than riding a road bike. And did you ever consider perhaps using an e-bike? No, didn't consider it. Now, when I was three quarters of the way up Bringer Pass, I thought it might be a good idea. But other than that, no. Because presumably when you were on the trip itself, you must have seen, because this surprised me last summer, uh, seeing the number of people who were cycle touring using e-bikes. I think probably there were more out there using e-bikes, certainly in Germany uh, and Switzerland, than there were on ordinary bikes. Agreed. There were a lot of people on e-bikes in Germany. And I was sometimes a little jealous. And then I actually came to the realization that it was an amazing thing to see. It certainly made cycling available to anybody who really wanted to cycle still all in into your nineties, maybe a disability, but you were able to get out and still enjoy those wonderful bike paths. Mm. Now you flew to Europe and you arrived on the well, you set off on your cycle on the 4th of September, which is the day after I actually finished. So I arrived in Rotterdam and I took my ferry back home on the 3rd of September after my tour around Europe. And you presumably arrived. Did you go to the Hook of Holland? Did you go all the way up to the sign to start your journey? We well, did not. We started at Schiphol, the airport in Amsterdam. And our first planned trip was to Huda or like we say in America, Gouda, Howda, or we say in America, Gouda, um, Holland. But we ended up making a detour to Leiden in hot in Holland, which was a wonderful experience. And we met a man there who our friends had hosted in the U S as warm showers host. Their friend, their friend, Mark lives in Leiden and he had stayed with them a couple summers ago. Yes as a warm showers host, which with which both of us do, we participate with warm showers. So we met Mark in Leiden, and then we skirted Rotterdam and headed toward Kinderdijk. Okay, so I'm looking on the map here. Yeah, I can find Leiden. So you, and you did a, a, am I right in thinking you did a bit of a loop, uh, a loop down to Rotterdam and then back on yourself? Yes. That's what my Strava feed shows. <laughs> a little loop, yes. And then you followed the Rhine, uh, down to Koblenz, but then you went and you went to revisit the places that you presumably lived in, in Germany in the 80s and 90s, yeah? Yes, mm-hmm. that's exactly what we did. We followed the Rhine down to um, Wiesbaden area and then picked up the Main River because Frankfurt and Hanau are on the Main. So we went through where we met and spent a little time there, uh, revisited the old apartment that we lived in together mm-hmm. and then we headed south 
to the Bamberg area where uh, Pam and Ralph had been stationed and had still had a lot of German friends there. We visited some um, good friends. Um, you mentioned warm showers. Were you using warm showers all the time or were you in hotels or camping? We had plans and desires to do several different accommodation types. We wanted to stay in campgrounds, Airbnbs, warm showers, and hostels. We camped basically the first month. Yes. All the way from Amsterdam through through to Bamberg. To yes, well, the first month to Vicenza, where we where we did get rid of our tent. Several times along the way from Amsterdam to Vicenza, we did stay in accommodations and with friends of our riding partners. When we got to Vicenza, it was after October. It was, we were heading into October and the camping season was coming to an end and accommodations were getting cheaper as we headed east and southeast. So we actually got rid of our tents. We kept our sleeping bags, but we got rid of the tents and then we used Airbnbs and we looked for warm showers hosts, but one of the problems we had with that was, and I I see this now as a host myself, many warm showers hosts advertise their site for two people. They may not have room for more. So there was four of us traveling, but we did find a man in Albania. His name is Chuck and he is famous on world sh- warm showers. He's just a, an amazing host. He wasn't even home and he allowed us to stay in his home. And he is amazing. Yes. He's just amazing. The only accommodation we were not able to satisfy was the hostels. And we looked and we looked and we looked, um, but we never really found one where we needed it. And accommodations were so incredibly cheap, whether it was a hotel or an apart- a two bedroom apartment at the end, Indeed. we were paying 25 25- dollars or less a couple for wonderful, amazing accommodations, including breakfast. And when you were in Germany, is there a, a any kind of network or any kind of group associated with the American military, which you can use to find accommodation? Can you, for example, as an ex-military person, could you arrive at a, an army base and say, hey, can we use one of your empty um, rooms for the night to get to, to stay in? Is that possible? Yes, uh, it is possible, not just by going to any base, but there are um, U.S. military-run resorts. So there's one in Garmisch uh, down on the border, uh, and it was wonderful. We, we, we were actually there when we were very young, uh, but to go back to it, and we were able to stay at the resort. It's just a giant resort hotel in Garmisch. We stayed there for two nights, uh, prepared to go over the Alps from there, really. Tried to get our mind, get my mind wrapped around the thought of cro- crossing those mountains. And we did also in Vicenza. We, we were able to use the military post in Vicenza, Italy. Because that way, all the gear that we brought that you realize you really don't need, <laughs> and you can get rid of some of that weight, we were able to use the U.S military post office there and ship things back to America at domestic rates. Sounds like a good plan. How, how many days did it take you just to get into the rhythm of uh, cycle touring, especially as it was something that you'd never done before? How, you know, Was it a week or so? Was it a month before you really felt comfortable or was it quite quick? I don't know. You know, uh, that is a good question, Andrew. People who are experienced that we talk to, um, said, uh, if you get past day three, you're, you'll be fine. And others said maybe day five, and you will get over the hump of riding daily and, uh, and know that you have what it takes to do it. I thought, first of all, we were in the Netherlands when we started, which is nice and flat, all the way to the German border. Plus, for some reason, we had almost no wind so by day, end of day two, I think we were pretty much in the groove. It was old hat already. I think the fact that 
all four of us were so into this event. We, we all four of us wanted to be there so bad. We got along so well. For me, by the, by day one, before we even started, I was in that mode. As Ron said, I had read or heard on a YouTube video to not get upset if you uh, feel like you want to stop in a week, but just to keep going and it, that it took several days, a week, eight, 10 days to get going. But to be honest with you, I was... I was in it from the day we left the Moxie Hotel at the Shaipol Airport. I was so happy to be there. I felt like it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, agree. And when you were cycling, uh, I, when I go cycling, it's usually just me on my own. And lots of people do it as a couple. Far fewer do it as a group of four. So when you were cycling, did you stay together as a group of four or did you split up into two couples or did you go individually or was it three and one? Uh, was there a big distance between the person at the front and the person at the back? Uh, or was it like a little uh, Tour de France peloton? <laughs> That's how I like to ride. <laughs> Tour de France peloton, riding behind people and drafting. <laughs> but we soon learned from our experienced hosts that for several reasons, safety, traffic, it was best to ride a little bit separate. So we would ride as couples. One day, Ron and I, one day, Pam and, and Ralph would ride in front as couples. And we would space ourselves out a little bit. A few hundred meters. A few hundred meters for safety, for the traffic. But with that being said, coming from the States... The, car, the drivers in Europe, and especially when we got to the Balkans, were so accommodating. It was incredible. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the, They were so willing to share the road. No disrespect at all on the road. Now, when we were on the paths, as you know, in Holland and Germany and Italy and Austria, there's so many dedicated bike paths. But I think when we got to the Balkans and we started riding, we did separate for safety but never, never anyone. Not far. Not far out. No, usually within eyesight. I kept Ron close in case I got a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever, were there any days when you decided perhaps that one couple would just uh, go at their own pace and that you would just simply meet at the end of the day uh, and not worry about sticking together as a group? No, we talked about that, but no one ever really got that far in advance. And we so enjoyed stopping together, especially mid-morning and mid-afternoon for coffee and pastry uh, and just soaking it in mm -hmm. that s separating was not even, I don't think that was on their mind at all either. We, we, we enjoyed each other's company and it, each couple's exuberance of what we were experiencing. I will say at the end though, because we were the, we were not experienced at all and they were more experienced. I do feel that in the beginning, we probably clung closely to them. Maybe they wanted to separate, but I don't think we <laughs> gave it a thought, but toward the end, Ron and I were much more comfortable with our distance being, you know, several hundred yards to miles, we would, we would say, I, I think, and maybe that was their, looking back, maybe that was their way of teaching us and eventually letting go of us yeah. and saying, oh, you know, I think, I think maybe Ron and Susan can handle being apart from us because they would, if looking back, I can remember them saying, you guys go ahead, right ahead. But they never, they never let us, you know, stray too far or into un, um, unfamiliar or uncomfortable situations. They were amazing, amazing teachers. So you crossed the Alps. I'm just having a look on my map now. You crossed the Alps, you said, at the Brenner Pass, yeah? Yes. Was there any particular reason for choosing that particular pass? I think that was the pass that Ralph chose. <laughs> <laughs> he would, Ralph laid out most, he laid out 99% of this of this route for us. You know, we deviated a little bit, especially in Greece, but um, 
he chose the route and researched it greatly and he had a tremendous amount of experience. Um, so we trusted what he chose uh, to get us there without too much difficulty. Although I tell you, I was, I was worried about the Alps. I was very worried. When we left Innsbruck, I was worried. But he chose that one, I think mostly because it was probably going to be the simplest way for us to get to Vicenza. And I had watched tons. Again, I had watched so much in the two years of planning. I watched every YouTube video possible. And so many people had crossed Brenner Pass successfully, north and south, and we came from the north. I could watch the videos. I could see other women do it, which made me comfortable. It was a very doable pass. We stayed on the road for that. I, I'm not sure about Euro Velo routes, but we actually rode the road with the cars and vehicles. Mm -hmm. So the, um, what's this called? The grade. The grade was, you know, graded for cars. So it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't horrific. Yeah. I'm just looking now on Wikipedia and it's 1,000... 370 meters so it's not it's not a very high pass you can certainly go well over 2000 meters uh with the paved roads but it's still you know it's still a significant climb that's higher than any mountain here in the uk for example and i think they were it was graded appropriately so it wasn't as much steepness as it was long longness they were they were long climbs yeah they were long. The first day was about 20 miles of climbing mm -hmm. once we left Innsbruck. We stopped, the first night we stopped, we had planned to go all the way to Brenner Pass, but with weather, we stopped six miles short of the top at a wonderful <laughs> guest house. Amazing guest house. Wonderful guest house, where they actually offered us, with our check-in, two free train tickets. For the women only. For the women only, but we didn't take them. Pam and I were really up for the ride, and um, that's what made <clears throat> that's what made doing this uh, exciting was to get to the top riding. But I, we thought it was funny that there was two free tickets. So the next day we had six miles, and the the host of the guest house said to us, Franz. His name was Franz. I'll have to send you his hotel website. He was wonderful, amazing man. He was a cyclist. He had a bicycle garage for us. And the next morning I said, okay, Franz, I'm really scared. What is this next six miles going to be like? And he was like, you are going to be laughing all the way to the top. And he was being funny. And so as we were riding, we were laughing. Uh -huh. Those six next six miles were, I don't think they were as tough as the day before, but they were, they were tough. And we were laughing all the way. And at the top, we were laughing and crying. And we actually called him when we got to the top to say, we did it. And we laughed all the way. And thank you for everything. It, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Remember that? I do. It must have been a very nice ride from the top of the Brenner Pass all the way back, all the way down to Venice, no? Oh, yes. Amazing. Oh, yeah. the rails to trails, the old railway path going down. Just simply amazing. The views. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's was, not a cat, there's not a camera or a drone that can actually capture that beauty. Yeah, it was just amazing. It was everything. And was it a predominantly downhill route from uh the Brenner Pass all the way down to Venice? It it was. Yeah. It really was. All the way to Vicenza it was. We didn't ride our bikes to Venice. We rode our bikes to Vicenza. We day tripped by train without our bikes to Venice on my birthday. For her birthday, yes. So we took a break in Vicenza where the Ar U.S. Army base was and did our laundry, did our shipping of our excess items. And then the next day we were able to ride. We stayed two days there because we, right. had, we had our bicycles serviced in Vicenza and had new chains put on because we were truly uncertain of what services would be available uh, in Eastern Europe. Right. And then when we left to Vicenza, we did ride back in the direction of Venice, but we kind of skirted it and ended that night in Chicago. 
Is that how you say that? I think that's it. Right. Close enough. Yeah. Which was like a little Venice. And then you followed the coast down uh, via Rimini to Ancona before taking the ferry over to Croatia and then down the Adriatic coast, Dubrovnik, all the way down into Albania. How was that section along the coast in both Italy and Croatia? Amazing. Yes. Amazing. The Italian coast, we had been, we've been to Italy before, uh, to the Tuscany region. We'd never been on that coast, no, never, on the had, Adriatic coast. No, it had not been. It was, it was a tremendous, it was, it was, you know, it's flat. You just roll along uh, day by day. And I don't recall, what was it? Oh, Ravenna. Ravenna was probably one of the highlights of that coast because we just kind of rolled in there as a stop for the day and realized once we got there that it was the mosaic tile capital of, of Italy, you know. Mosaics from the fifth century. And, and uh, we kind of let this trip just roll, you know, wherever the day led us. And it let, when it led us to Ravenna, and we realized we were in the mosaic capital, cap- mosaics from the fifth century and the Byzantine Empire. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. We had we had we we could not have planned it better. No. It sounds to me as though you were taking quite a flexible approach to this and you uh, you were making decisions as the days went by. For example, how far in advance were you planning the accommodation? Right. So like Ron said, Ralph was amazing and he planned out a bullet point trip and then as we went through that it was very flexible so we knew the direction we were heading and we knew where we wanted to be and we only had a few hard stops we had to get to the ferry on a particular day because of tickets so for accommodations we would some days the day of camping the day of with Airbnbs, maybe two days. Sometimes we might have done three days at the most, but we never had any trouble. We used mm-hmm. booking.com and hotels.com mm-hmm. after we stopped camping, and we never had trouble finding a place. I will say the east coast of yeah, the east coast of Italy there, during that particular time of the year, going through all those resort towns. They were, they were ghost towns. There was nobody there. Hotels were closed for the season. Um, so we had the roads to ourselves. We didn't have to specifically look for, for bike paths anymore. And we could ride the middle of the road with not a care in the world, which made the ride fantastic, especially if you had the wind at your back. Did you ever consider just continuing all the way down the Italian coast to Bari or Brindisi and getting a ferry from there? Well, I think the original plan had been to go to Rome and then somewhere, I don't exactly remember when. That is right. Ron would know better, but we changed it to go to Athens and we wanted to get across. We wanted to make that, once we decided to go to Athens, we wanted to make that cross as soon as possible so that we could experience the Balkans. Yeah, Originally, we were going to cross at Ancona and go to, what was it, Zadar? Right, Zadar. That's what that was the original plan. Um, but the ferry schedule worked out for Split. Yes, Split is a beautiful place, as is Dubrovnik. Uh, oh, yes, amazing. And where did you stay in Dubrovnik? Well, the, so my birthday we spent in Vicenza. No, Venice. Venice. My birthday we spent in Venice, and then Pam's birthday fell in Dubrovnik. So we actually splurged and stayed at a very nice hotel. Yeah. For two nights in Dubrovnik. Stayed at the Sheraton. Because it was a beautiful, that is just the most amazing, the whole, the entire time we were in the Balkans, we had never experienced such magnificent beauty. When we first saw the Split and we first saw that coastline, we all were so choked up. It was nothing we, like we'd ever seen. And we're very well traveled. Pretty well traveled. They're very well traveled. Yes. And when we saw the Adriatic from that side and the coast, and for weeks we rode it all the way down through Greece, it was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. 
Yeah, and Dubrovnik is in a spectacular setting, isn't it? When you're on the road oh. above above Dubrovnik and you stop and you look down across the water and there you've got Dubrovnik and the reeves of Dubrovnik just yes. below you. It's quite a well, very spectacular sight. Yes, the enti- that the entire coastline is phenomenal. Of course, when you're on a bicycle, oh, as each day comes to an end, you know you're going to be riding down to your accommodations, yeah. and in the morning you're going to ride back up out of that small town on the coast. You know you got to climb back up to the road and move on. Dubrovnik was very hilly. Yeah, I actually had my worst. Um, I never had a, I never had a bad day on the bike ride, but I was a little bit fearful of the downhill, the descents, and we left Dubrovnik one day to go to the hotel and we had to go up forever, ever, ever. And then we had to come down forever. And it was a very steep descent. And I actually, I actually got a little bit upset on that, on that yeah, downhill. Got upset at me. Got upset at Ron on that downhill. But it was, it, I, the Brovnik was a highlight of the trip. Now this will be episode 69 of this podcast and episode 68 that I actually recorded earlier today uh, with uh, a chap called Tony Lenehan, an English chap who decided he cycled from Bilbao in Spain and he also went to Athens uh, and when he arrived in Italy he was taking ferries across the Mediterranean when he arrived in southern Italy his initial plan had been to to take the ferry from Bari to Albania, but instead, based upon what he'd read about Albania, he decided instead that he would just go from uh, Bari down into Greece instead because he was a bit apprehensive about what he'd read uh, and what he'd heard firsthand from people he'd met in Italy, for example, about his experiences or about their experiences in Albania. So he decided uh, not to risk it. And Albania does have a, uh, a reputation in Europe for being um, perhaps the... Having been myself, I know what it's like, but it still does have a reputation of, as being a bit like the, the Wild West of Europe. It's the, the place which is the perhaps the least developed, although now obviously it's a democracy and it's uh, developing fast. Were you in any way apprehensive about going to Albania? I was not. Uh, not because I hadn't, not because of anything I'd read or not read. Uh, I felt comfortable. First of all, we were a group of four, not just two, which made me feel uh, probably a little better. Uh, we had been in contact with the man oh, Chuck with warm showers in, in Skoda. So, uh, I thought it felt rather welcoming. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was I was apprehensive. I had read the history of Albania. And although I was very apprehensive, I was also so excited because I knew this was an opportunity for me of a lifetime. And we we never had one single problem. No. In Albania, it is a beautiful, beautiful country. It's developing. You can see them um, making changes and growing. But for us on our trip, we found great roads. We found accommodating drivers, accommodating accommodations, good food. Friendly people. We were cautious with our water. We, We made sure we bought water. And I think I think the safety net of having a group of four, uh, I think a group of four was probably a good safety net. Mm-hmm. But we honestly had not, we did, honestly did not experience anything negative. Just to clarify, the the riding conditions, the state of the roads, for example, and the way in which drivers did they respect you as cyclists? Uh, they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, had no problems. No one was angry. Everybody was accommodating. We had one truck in the Dubrovnik area that closely 
came in close contact with us. You know, it was a, how do you say that? We had one truck in Dubrovnik that uh, passed us a little bit too close for comfort. And I think we had one bus or truck in Albania do the same thing. Otherwise, they would slow for us. They would widely pass for us. That's good to hear because I was there in 2013, so nearly nearly 10 years ago. Hopefully things have progressed. When I was there, the, the condition of the roads was particularly poor uh, in some areas. We saw a lot of EU road development. You crossed over to Corfu and then from Corfu you went back onto the mainland into Greece. And that's basically how you crossed the border between Albania and Greece. Did you ever consider going across the land border, a little bit inland? I think originally our plan had been to possibly go through Macedonia. And then mm. when we further, when we got further into our trip, time-wise, we knew we needed to be to Athens by a particular date because we ended our trip with a celebration at Santorini. So we had air, airline tickets. We had a, a date we had to make. So instead of crossing, we knew that it would be an easier, although it was very hilly, <laughs> probably a more, uh, probably a better route was for us to stay on the coast and continue on the coast. Yeah. Originally, we were supposed to go through Macedonia, and we we're also supposed to go through um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and we didn't do either of those. So we... we we had hoped to hit 10, and we hit eight countries. Now, the last section of your route, uh, mentioning Tony again, who I talked to earlier, the last bit of your route was almost identical to his, uh, with one small difference, um, which is around the lake where there's the tunnel that you can't go through, which causes problems, but it looks to me as though you avoided that. Um, now, he loved that part of his cycle along the coast of Greece and then uh, over the bridge into the Peloponnese and then along the coast and into Athens. Did you have a good experience in Greece? Yeah, it was tremendous. It was tremendous. Yeah. It was the most beautiful place. If you asked me what heaven looked or smelled like, I would tell you to visit Greece. I think that's what heaven is going to look like and that's what it's going to smell like. It was the most fragrant place I've ever been. And I think it was the olive groves i'm not sure it was it was fragrant i don't know what it was but it sure smelled good one of the interesting tools that we were afforded once we left albania and headed through greece we had met a man named i think his name was anthony anthony yeah. anthony the the british guy yes he was a young single solo rider and he was riding to athens and he rode, we met him at, a, at breakfast one morning, and then he stayed about a day ahead of us, maybe a half a day. He did not go to Corfu. He continued down the coast, entered, uh, entered Greece via land. So he was, a, and we, we kept in contact with him on the what's, the, what's that app called? What's WhatsApp. And he would tell us, so he told us about that tunnel, for example, so we knew to avoid that. He told us about the bridge and I forget where the bridge was at, but you had to like take everything off your bike, carry it up the ladder, and then go over the new bridge. And we decided to take a, about a 30-minute ferry instead. So having him about a half a day, a day ahead of us, the last week of our trip was really wonderful. He yeah. kind of gave us... He was feeding us a daily re reconnaissance for our next day's trip. <laughs> Via WhatsApp, yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think you made a you made a, a good decision there on avoiding that bridge, or avoiding that um, on avoiding that tunnel because uh, I knew nothing of it, and I arrived at the southern end, and then suddenly realised that I couldn't cycle through. And uh, Tony last year he arrived at the northern end and had a similar experience. But we, in our own respective ways, we all we both managed to get through. Uh, but it looks as though yeah, you were forewarned, so therefore you managed to avoid it. Did you cross at the bridge which submerges? Y yes, that's the bridge we crossed. And I Doesn't wanted to happen. wait for it to happen, but we didn't have the time. We did wait around a little bit, but it didn't occur while we were there. 
But that was that was something. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This thing actually submerges? That's crazy. But yeah, that was a very interesting cut of rock. And we had had three weeks, oops, the, the three weeks we were in the Balkans and into Greece, we had nothing but amazing, beautiful weather. Yeah. So that day we were in Corinth, it was absolutely amazing. It was, it was breathtaking. Beautiful, breathtaking. I'm, I'm kind of asking you the same questions that I asked earlier, but I'm going to ask this one as well. Did you, um, did you have a particular point in Athens where you thought, yes, that's going to be the finish line? For example, the Acropolis, was that going to be the, the point at which you finished your trip? That was it. That, mm-hmm. The Acropolis was it. And yep. we had a devil of a time getting to it. Right. That, I think that was the worst day of navigation we had was yeah. getting to the Acropolis. But, for, yes. For some reason, our, our map kept um, getting, you know, how they get lost they in reroute, the buildings and reroute you and reroute, reroute you. Yeah. And uh, we could see it. We could see the Acropolis. And we were so tired and so excited to get there. We could see it, but we just couldn't make our way through there. And, and we finally did. And, and uh, we took the photo and then we... We, you know, we started our trip uh, leaving the Moxie Hotel in in uh, Schiphol, cool. and we ended it staying at the Moxie in Athens. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, wonderful hotel chain. Yes, it was wonderful. But getting up there, um, I was so worried that it was going to be an anticlimactic event, and it wasn't. It was. I was so sad to see the trip end. I was. I was almost devastated to see it end. And at that point. I was ready to continue riding, and I thought, "Oh, I can, I can ride all the way to Turkey. I've done, I've done this. I'm going to ride to Turkey." But it was time to stop, and it, it was not anticlimactic. It was, it was amazing, and I think we stood up there, and as if no one else was in the entirety of Athens, just the four of us, and we tried to get the best picture with the Acropolis behind us. Yeah. And then we were there for a couple of days, but we held off on visiting the Acropolis until we flew to Santorini to celebrate. And then we flew back. And then when we arrived back, we visited the Acropolis and, and just, it's just the, another one of the most amazing places we've ever seen. On your website, you say that you had provisionally allotted five train journeys. You mentioned taking one train earlier from where you were staying, Vicenza to Venice. Is that one of the two that you did actually take? And where was the other one? So I got this idea from your... Grand Tour. Your Grand Tour. Or or maybe prior, maybe on one of your prior, prior podcasts, you had said, you know, you talked about making a lengthy trip and allotting yourself some train segments. So in the back of my mind, the train was always there as another safety net. But we we took we were going to allow a lot ourselves five train trips, and mm-hmm. we ended up taking two, and both of those were less than sixty kilometers. We took one early on in Germany, around a very industrial area on the on the Rhine. Is Koblenz Koblenz or Dusseldorf a very industrial area, and then one more down toward the Bamberg area in order to get to our um, our stay that night. We were staying with friends of the other couple and we didn't want to ask them to change their dates. So we took a train, but again, it was just to get us maybe 40, 60 kilometers down the road. And then we always held those, those other three train passes um, in our back pocket but the day we went to Vicenza via train was just for the day. And then we rode the train back to our bicycles and continued on yeah. via the road. Yeah, I think you made a good decision regarding that bit along the, the Rhine, because the Rhine is beautiful, but it does have its sections where you think, oh, I remember cycling through Mainz, Wiesbaden area, uh, thinking, whoa, I think I'd rather be somewhere else. But uh, yeah. Um, is there any part of your trip that you would actually have changed that you would have done differently? Oh, let me see. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so. There's a few lessons learned and a few things that uh, we would take that we didn't take. 
we would take a GoPro. We would love to have footage of yes. the actual trip. But I would always joke and I would probably have my GoPro. I would probably be hitting the GoPro on button at every head turn. Yeah. Because it was so magnificent. But as far as changing the trip or changing the route, um, I don't think so. Uh, the only change I would make was I, I, I could go the exact same route. I would, instead of spending 52 days, I would spend like 72 days doing it and really stop and explore more along the way. Uh, but we were kind of both on a time schedule to get back to back home. Uh, life continues to go. Uh, but I would like to have spent a little more time in a couple of places in Germany and maybe a little more time in the Alps just exploring. Ron, do you have a French passport? I do not. I could I could get one. I just never have done it. Because if you got a French passport, then obviously you could spend many, many, many months, if not years, just uh, cycling around. That's right. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. We have talked about that. Yeah. I have all the paperwork. I could do it. And what was the highlight? If you had to pinpoint one thing, which was the best place or the best aspect of the journey, what would it be? It was wonderful to revisit where we had started our life and where we had brought our babies home from the hospital. It was wonderful to revisit that. It was wonderful to revisit where we had gone on our first trip together. But for me, experiencing the Balkans was the highlight. I, I, I love the Balkans. I hope to go back. Even to Albania, I would, I would go back. It's, it's very developing. I'd go back. I loved Greece. I would love to do the trip again. I would do the whole trip again. Presumably, if you were in the military in the 1990s in Germany, were you, you must have been very, very aware of the the issues and the problems and, well, the war and the destruction that took place in the Balkans during the 1990s. Very much so. I fortunately, you know, didn't go to support any of that activity there. Uh, been to other places to support combat, but uh, that was not one of them, although I certainly had plenty of friends who served in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it was terrible. Um I was very happy to see the recovery in such a short period of time, you know, in the grand scheme of, of things. It, a very short period of time has gone by. Even for Albania and the lockdown that they had for decades, uh, you know, it was amazing to see the progress progression there. Yeah, and especially Dubrovnik, because Dubrovnik was quite badly damaged during the war. But you go now, and it is one of the most beautiful places to visit. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to believe that they had a war so recently. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to your next trip. Where where are you off next? Well, well. We, we, have, <laughs> we have a plan to 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 go probably this June. Yep. Um, to we plan to fly back into to um, Amsterdam and cycle down through Belgium to France and then do the northern coast loop through Brittany and then down to La Rochelle to, to see my uh, mother. Because unfortunately here in the last two weeks, um, to about two weeks ago now, uh, my stepfather, he's 91 and three quarters, he passed. So uh, man, I was in France this past month to visit with him, you know, just days before he passed. So going to see my mother now is even more important because she's, you know, uh, by herself, although she has my family, she has my cousins and there to, to help her and be close to her. Mm -hmm. But just here within the last 48 hours, there's the strong possibility that our soon to be 13 year old grandson may join us on this next trip this summer. So there's some logistics to go through and uh, his mother is acquiring, going to acquire a passport as quickly as possible. And his dream is to go to England. So we may alter our plans and fly into London and then cycle down to the uh, 
south coast, you know, southwest coast and take the ferry over to St. Malo. And that was a question we were going to have for you also, is uh, the the biking paths and cycle ability of that portion of, of the UK? Ooh, good question. I've not cycled along the coast. Um, if you fly into London, if you fly into Heathrow, you can certainly... I used to live west of London in a place called Reading, and you can certainly... There's a route that takes you all down the, well, the River Thames and then the canals, and you can continue following that. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to piece together a route that takes you down eventually down to the southwest of England. And yeah, you should be, you know, there are lots of uh, fabulous places to visit. For example, you've got the, the New Forest, you've got the South Downs. It is worth looking, perhaps have a look at the uh, Sustrans website and they are the people who manage the National Cycle Network. And I'm sure you'll find lots of information there about the routes that you can take. It can be frustrating cycling in Britain compared to on the continent. I think countries on the continent have got a very different approach to cyclists and cycling infrastructure. But outside of the main urban areas, it can be, and often is, a very beautiful place to cycle. So yeah, I would head to the, go to the Sustrans website, have a look there, and um, I'm sure you'll find some good routes, and there are some beautiful places that you can visit. Would you presumably be taking the ferry from Portsmouth? Uh, I can't remember. I did look at a few names. I think that was it, Portsmouth to St. Malo. We're open to suggestions. Um, We kind of just changed this plan in the last 48 hours. We had it all mapped out from, from Amsterdam all the way through um, yeah, you know, all, all the way to Nantes. Yeah, you know, Dieppe, all the way through Nantes, and then skirt the Loire Valley and down to La Rochelle. But if we uh, can change, we might. I think the, the the main ferry that you'd take that most people take if they want to go to Brittany is the Portsmouth Saint Malo ferry, and then yes, then you can pick up the uh, the North. There's lots of obviously fantastic routes in in France, some of which I followed last year. You can cycle all the way along the north coast and then down the Vélo Odyssey, which will take you all the way yes. to La Rochelle itself. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, yeah, that's yeah. our plan for this summer. We, we plan to leave the first week of June, spend about six weeks there, and uh, we'll let you know what, what we decide because we'll, we'll probably be trying to pick your brain, maybe ask for some suggestions. We have our map. <laughs> That we have the IGN map. Oh, yes. Brilliant map. I, I bought that uh, last year. Brilliant map. It is. It's an excellent map. And the good thing about that map is that uh, for people obviously listening to this, that's the uh, the French national map that shows all the cycle routes. But it also shows you all the train routes as well. So you can, if you do want to, yes. if you do want to mix and match taking the train and taking some of those routes, you can see clearly where the train stations go from and to so yeah that's a very very good map yes right um and there's a website called freewheeling france freewheeling freewheeling france.com i think it is and lynn lynn ebb she runs that she lives in uh, she's a australian but she lives in uh, bordeaux and the website is excellent if you want to look up uh, different routes and uh, find all about cycling in France. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, good luck on your future travels. And um, thank you for taking part in the podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Here's to lots more long journeys in the future. And if we see you somewhere, we'll be happy to buy you a pint. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Well, Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. You've been inspirational. Well, thanks to Susan and Ron Crump. They say thank you to me for being inspirational, but I think they themselves are pretty inspirational. They're a couple, a retired couple, and to go on your first cycle touring holiday at their age and not to simply do it in a weekend or in a week or even a couple of weeks, but to take 52 days to cycle a couple of thousand kilometres across Europe is an inspirational thing to do. Now, a quick update on what Susan 
was saying about their plans for next year. It looks to me as though perhaps it's changed slightly. Uh, she's emailed me. Um, it looks to me as though they're not going to take their 13-year-old grandson, which is a shame for him, but I'm sure he'll get opportunities in the future to do similar things. She says that they're going to fly to Amsterdam and head in the direction of Rotterdam, then on to Ghent, Dunkirk, Calais and Dieppe, which is basically following the route that I took last summer, Le Havre, Caen, and then to Mont Saint-Michel. So they're basically following the Vélo Maritime, the Euro Vélo 4. Uh, then a little backtrack to the V40, to the V43. And I think if you listened to the episode of the podcast a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about Brittany, I think those two routes actually get mentioned there. Uh, and that will take them to Laval, then to Angers, from where they'll follow the Loire, the Eurovelo 6, I think it is, yeah, down the Loire to Nantes, and then they'll probably take the coastal Eurovelo 1 to La Rochelle, which is, of course, where Ron's mother lives. So that sounds like a plan. Now, if you want to read more about their trip from last year, their website is suzlearnsfrench.blog. That's S-U-Z, Suze, learnsfrench.blog. And if you go there, I'm sure you'll find out all you want to know about what they did last summer as well as what they're planning to do next summer. So that's the end of episode number 69. Not sure what number 70 will be, although I do have a I do have a suspicion that it might be me and nobody else, because I did think earlier, and I mentioned writing book four at the beginning of this episode of the podcast. I did think earlier it might be a good idea to start reading, go back to book one, Crossing Europe, and for me to start reading that in perhaps alternate episodes of the podcast. So to do one podcast where I'm reading from the book, it won't be a perfect glitch-free reading. It will probably be more like me reading the book and making a few additional comments and stumbling over my words and things like that. But I think that might be an idea. And if I do that... Uh, at least once a month over the course of the next, well, the next year or so. By the time I've done that, hopefully book four will also be ready for publication. I'm going to have to think about that a bit more. That was just me thinking off the top of my head uh, of an idea that I had earlier. Anyway, you can, of course, go and read all three books, Crossing Europe, Along the Med and Spain to Norway. They're all available on Amazon. And if you go to cyclingeurope.org forward slash books, I think, uh, I can even send you a, a signed copy. You can fill a form in there and I'll send you a signed copy of the books. So that's it for episode 69 of the Cycling Europe podcast. If you'd like to get in contact, then please do so. All the details are at cyclingeurope.org forward slash contact. And if you'd like to help support the podcast, which many of you have done over the course of the last year, 18 months, that would be fantastic. Please go to cyclingeurope.org forward slash support and you'll find all the details there. Another way in which you can support the podcast is by leaving a rating or a review on the podcast platform where you happen to be listening to this right now so hope you enjoyed this episode hope you've been inspired by the story of susan and ron crump if you'd like to contribute yourself get in contact next time it might just be me reading from book number one i'm not going to commit myself to that quite yet but i have a strong suspicion that that's what episode 70 might be all about so thank you for listening and happy cycling